Hi everyone, welcome to Steering Mariners. Today I have someone very interesting, someone I've never had on any of my video chats before. Uh, we have with us Monica, who is a marine engineer, and uh, she has uh, a lot to share about her journey as a professional mariner, as a marine engineer, and uh, uh, I'm sure you will be inspired by what she has to share with you guys. And uh, if you have any questions at the end of the video, you can post it in the comment section and I'll pass them on to Monica. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer it. So over to Monica. Monica, please introduce yourself uh, uh, in terms of, of course, they know your name now, but how you started this journey and where you are right now in this journey and what did it cost you? Over to you, Monica. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Monica. Um, I started this journey... <laughs> I don't know, probably six, six years ago now, um, I was living in the Northern Territory in Australia and I was sailing on yachts there just for pleasure, racing and other things. And then I did a race to Indonesia and I just really loved being at sea. And I was in a profession at the time in hospitality management. I had a good career, but I really decided at that time, I was, you know, 29 and I thought, do I really want to do this forever? And I thought, maybe not. I really love being at sea. So then I started researching what jobs there are at sea, et cetera. And um, ended up coming across the AMC and I knew someone else who was an integrated rating and found basically a course and thought, you know what, now's the time. So I went and did an integrated rating course. Um, I self-funded myself through that. That was about, I think, yeah, nine and a half thousand dollars. I funded myself to go down to school and do that course. Then went back to the Northern Territory and continued working. It was like a 12 week course and worked for a year mm. and was thinking, am I gonna ever get a job? Yeah. <laughs> was you know, getting a bit stressful because it was with yes. the big downturn in Australian shipping. And I thought, yes. you know, I'll just keep trying. I'll keep applying, you know, just gotta keep battling. And yeah, then I finally, a year later, I got a call from the company I work at now and jumped on a plane to Victoria the same day and had a job interview. And the next, yeah, about three weeks later, I heard from them and I had got my trainee, trainee time with them. So I went back to Melbourne and did nine months sea time as an IR. Right. Um, on the night I finished my sea time as an IR, I was having a chat with one of the engine first engineers and just talking about, you know, what I wanted to do. And I don't know, just talking about life, I guess. And mm -hmm. he sort of said to me, you know, are you going to do this forever? And I just sort of thought, I'm not sure if, you know, like, is this, can I do this for the next, you know, 40, 30 years or whatever? I yeah. thought, no, nah, I want to, you know, I really like engineering. Like mm -hmm. I really love being in the engine room. And he sort of said to me, well, you know, you can be. Of course you can do it. If you want to do it, you can do it. Mm. Um, I'll help you and, you know, I'll have a chat to people. And so he spoke to the chief engineer who then, you know, thought, well, she works hard, etc." And I think that's the biggest thing. Like if you're a hard worker, your company will, you know, go into bat for you sort of thing. Absolutely. And yeah. And so then went to my company well, they, he, he went to my company for me and they said yes. But then I found out, I went to the course and I found out I have to have a maths and physics from year 12. And I didn't do maths or physics or any science in year 12 and thought I was really bad at maths and thought mm. I was freaking out, thinking, oh, I'm not going to get in. Mm. So I had to do a priming course at uh, UTAS, which was like two courses at the same time, six weeks intensive. Wow. And I hired a tutor. And for 12 weeks, I saw a tutor every day Wow! and spent, yeah, like a, uh, I think it was close to four and a half thousand dollars on a tutor, but it was the best thing ever because then the maths mm. in the course was really like, I could do the maths. Like it made it so much easier having that intensive learning. But I mean, at the beginning I couldn't, I wouldn't know how to turn on a calculator. I couldn't do one plus one really. Like it was <laughs> bad. Yeah. Monica, you are giving us so many inspirations here. But I want to stop you because I don't. I okay. want. I want the viewers to be able to focus on some of the fantastic stuff you have mentioned, and they may okay. 
the first thing i want to talk about is of course uh, how you applied for jobs because uh, monica what happens is many young seafarers or many not young seafarers but many young students they come out of schools or colleges or, and uh, they want to join the uh, but they are often disheartened uh, that they don't find a job straight off but you have been applying for jobs you put yourself through the training you spend your own money what mm. do you want to give these guys who want to join ships but they are often discouraged when we tell them that they have to apply for jobs they have to go out yeah. and what message would you give them well i think mother in my experience i think it's really important to have a good resume mm -hmm. like spend the time send your resume to other people in the industry if you know other people get them to check it get mm -hmm. it checked 50 times if you can you know like get help with it and may have a good resume because it really mm -hmm. matters if you see i think a good resume Hmm. And that's what I had been told. And hmm. I think that helped because I actually ended up, I got a call from Farstad as well hmm. initially, but then Farstad had done a lot of ships. But then I think there's this dedication and persistence. You just have yeah. to try and you like, you find out every company you go online and you just look at every single company that's sailing hmm. in waters around and you just find out who the human resources person is and you just apply and, and you, you just keep applying. And you have to be patient, isn't it? I'm sure you were being patient. Yeah. You did not give up very quickly. And no. I think that's the message out there uh, that uh, the students and the you know prospective students, because we always always get these inquiries and we tell yeah. them that you know people will not come to you and give you the job. You have to go out there and advertise. Yeah, them. you have to. Yeah, yeah. And definitely. And to, sorry, Monica, um, yeah. because you said so many inspiring things. I don't. I want to ask you about that before I forget. Yeah. Uh, you also talked about sailing on pleasure yachts and. Uh, and then, of course, all that time on pleasure yachts, was it counted in any way when you went for your certification? No. <laughs> no, but I mean, it was, for me, that was just a gateway to realise what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, the size of the yacht that I was, it was not very big. So maybe, maybe in terms, if you were on bigger yachts, you know, mm -hmm. but I was just sailing. And in terms of then going to sea, like, and having some idea what was going on, it was helpful. Mm -hmm. um but it didn't you know in terms of experience yes it helped me but in terms of actually yeah. you know being counted towards school time no none mm -hmm. of it sort of which yeah. is again very valuable because there are two lessons to learn from here for the students or the mariners out there that firstly that uh, monica went for her passion she found her passion and she went for it so unless you have a passion for sea and ships don't go in don't go in there expecting high yeah. salaries and money it's not about adventures. It's not like Pirates of the Caribbean or anything. You must have a passion for it. Yeah. The second thing is that uh, Monica did uh, put in her own money when she put herself through the training without really having the job secured for herself. So she took that chance and she took that chance because she believed in herself and she, you know, she had a passion to find that. That is something you guys have to do as well, that you have to find, you have to put yourself sometimes through the pre-sea training or some kind of basic training. Because that shows the employers that you are serious about joining ships. Isn't that yep. right, Monica? Is that right? Yeah, and especially in if you're in Australia in this day and age, in, you know, in this age of shipping in Australia, I think it really matters because it's a yeah. lot more competitive. It's a lot harder to find work. And so yeah. if they've seen that you've put yourself through even a component of it, you're more employable. And, yeah. you know, and then also the other thing is putting you through, you get contacts. Like my one of my teachers in my IR course um, ended up being my reference for my toll, uh, my job, yeah, my to job interview. Mm. Yes. So, this, you know, you is, can get these contacts that are really Absolutely. Helpful. And this yeah. is again something very valuable you are telling us here, uh, Monica, that we are, this is, education should also be not only thought about from a certification point of view or money point of view, think about it from a networking and having contact. Yeah, 100% which is so important uh, to find a job in any industry anyway. Monica, then I want to ask you about the money that you spent on, uh, you know, those tuitions and you spent a lot and many people will shy away from that. Uh, but uh, how did you think when you were spending your own money and you were, this was something that you had to do to have a foundation for your further studies. Uh, yeah. What inspired you to spend that money and what did you tell yourself when you were spending that money for tuitions? Well, I, I knew I was going to be sponsored through my engineering course by my company mm. at that time. Mm. And I couldn't imagine going through and then not passing when I've been yeah. given that opportunity. So yeah. I looked at it as an investment into my yeah, 
career because I, you know, I didn't have my maths. I had to do you do it to get in the course, and I just thought, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. You know, I some I like I learn better one on one with someone yeah. explaining stuff to me with things like that and showing me. And I just thought that it would be invaluable, really. And like, yeah. it, it was the best thing I did. I mean, it was a bit of money well spent. I got some of it back in tax, which is also yeah. I didn't even realize would happen, yeah. which yeah, was a right. massive yeah. benefit at the end, yes. like uh, when it came to tax time. But yeah. um, yeah, it was definitely worth it. I mean, yeah, just and to. Then, and Monica, to inspire the people out there, we have a lot of students who come into their studies maybe after a long gap or mm. they don't have a math or science background. Just like you said, you didn't even know how to use the calculator properly. Yeah. Uh, your life or rather your journey shows that anybody can do it. What advice would you give to shy away from it because of a fear of math or science? I, well, literally, I thought I was... I, from my experience at high school, like I just thought I was bad at maths. I just thought I don't have a mathematical, mathematical mind. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. But I mean, you know, 14 year old Monica at high school is probably a bit different to like, you know, me at 32 or whatever that really wants to succeed at something. And, you know, anyone can learn it. Like anyone can do maths if you get the right help. And mm. I, you know, I needed so much of it because I had to do the bridging courses to get in. But even if you don't need to do the bridging courses, like just having that one-on-one -on -one tutoring time with someone and like finding someone that would do it, which is often a teacher will help you, you know, like there's other, like finding a means to get that extra help. Like don't be afraid to sort of get the extra help. And it's, you know, anyone can do it. Like it, it is, yeah. you know, Absolutely. This is what I want the viewers to learn that, you know, people often shy away from uh, when they hear that we are doing a bachelor's of nautical science because they feel they don't have a science or a math background. It's not like that. People like Monica no. are showing you that if you really put in the hard work, and I'm sure she has, if you put in the hard work and even with the tuition I'm sure that she had to put in the work, believe in yourself, put in the hard work there and definitely you'll reach the finish line because hard work will get you there inspired by this. Um, Monica, so of course, at the end of uh, nine months as an IR, um, you had of either joining the deck or the engine. And yes. this is something I want to talk about as well, because often uh, people out there, especially school leavers, they think that they have to be only cadets to get themselves started, whereas they can join as IRs if they want to, and then they can decide between the two departments which one they want to pursue. Is that correct? Yeah, well... If you join, become an IR and want to pursue the deck pathway, um, it's a lot shorter because you have that sort of deck experience um, mm -hmm. and you, you're up on the bridge, you're, you know, you're steering, you're in, you know, it's, it's a lot more sort of a relevant pathway. Mm -hmm. um, that's what my company said to me. Why don't mm -hmm. we do this? We have a, quite a few guys that have been IRs. I think three mm -hmm. in our company that have been IRs and then have become um, officers. Mm -hmm. And... I, in my wisdom, decided, no, I've got to start from the beginning and did the full, um, with the engineering, you have to, none of it counts. So you have yeah. to go back to the beginning and do the full four year, three and a half, four year degree. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. So which is, which is again, very inspiring for people who are watching out there. So Monica did not just take the sort of the, what we consider the easy way to the deck side, just because people yeah. said so. she was constantly following her passion. Uh, she did not worry about the time or the, you know, the effort it's going to take. And this is what I want you guys to learn who are out there, maybe who are thinking about joining ships or who are working on ships. Anything that you do, you must have a genuine interest for it. Don't think about it from a time perspective or what is easier. Nothing is easy. And But, you know, Monica pursued the engineering line. So, Monica, after nine months of uh, as an integrated rating, which is IR, uh, you had the choice of going either the deck or engineers, but you went into the engineering streamline or engineering line rather mm -hmm. yourself through college again and you are doing that course and uh, now what has your experience been uh, as a student now who's trying to uh, you know chase that certificate which will get you uh, the you know the promotions and the job uh, secured well i was lucky because i was working as an ir and i think whatever whichever position you're in if you work hard or you know, and people see you working hard, then you are more likely to get that option to go into other pathways as opposed to they're not going to, your company's not going to sponsor you if yeah. you're not the right candidate. 
So yeah. I was lucky to be that. And so they sponsored me for university and now I've got half my seat time done and I've got four more months I get on the ship on Friday and four more months and then I'm just going to sit my first set of orals, which mm. is exciting. And yeah. yeah, and hopefully, I mean, I'll be lucky enough to continue to get work at, at my job once I'm qualified. Absolutely, Monica. I, then that's why I have these video chats because uh, I just don't want to tell students out there that you should be working hard. I want to. I want them to hear it from people who are actually putting in the work. That there is no shortcut to success. What I see with the generation these days, they think it's a shortcut. They can quickly hmm. make lots of money. It's a shortcut. It's not a shortcut. You have to put in the hard work. Just like Monica is saying, the company will prefer you. The company will give you opportunities if they find that you are putting in the work. Don't look for shortcuts here. Uh, yeah. But Monica, tell me about the uh, the intensity of studies. Like I know that you said that you know you didn't have. Of course, you put yourself to tuitions and you taught yourself a lot of things. But the intensity of uh, you know a certification course. I'm sure you were doing a lot of units and then yeah. online because of COVID and all. Uh, how did you manage that kind of workload? And what were you doing? Were you also working on the ship at the same time, or how were you managing the workload of studies with the ship? No, I was full time studying. Um, I went back. I did six, I did my pre C of engineering. Um, and then I went back to C for six months just because I don't have an engineering background. I got, you know, I, I'm, I'm not mechanically minded. I sort of didn't know that much about it. So I sort of really, I really wanted to go back to C as a cadet and work in the engine room and get all, you know, gain as much knowledge as possible before I went back to college. Um, and then going back to college, I mean, it was intensive, but I think if you stay on top of it, you know, like it, mm. like anything, I mean, if you stay on top mm. of it, it's easy. Well, it's not mm. easy after that, scrap that. It's definitely yeah. not easy, it's not stressful, yet. but yeah. it makes it a lot easier if you don't, if you let it get out of bed, it's really yeah. stressful, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> I, think, I think, again, you have said something very inspiring here that uh, you guys don't need any engineering background, so don't think that, don't hold yourself back. I think this is something that as a young greener, probably I should have listened to and so inspiring to talk to Monica here that she didn't let anything hold her back. And that is the message I want to send guys out there that if you really want to pursue something, you have a passion, you have a genuine interest, chase it, put in the work. And I'm sure you will get that just like Monica has been, you know, pursuing her passion from the day one. Uh, so Monica, tell me a little bit now. I know you're almost going to finish your studies and you'll be a certified marine engineer and sailing on ships. So well done. Uh, I just want to know a little bit about the kind of ships you are sailing on. I know that you are sailing on uh, Roro ships and car carriers. Uh, can you describe a little bit about your life there or one? what kind of uh, work one should expect or what kind of life does Roro passenger ships has contracts uh, and the kind of workload? And, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're quite lucky in the terms that the run that we do on our ships is pretty set. So every day we leave port at 5.30 and you're in port in the morning. So, you know, it's great in terms of you're not really on voyage, doing long, you know, long voyages yeah. or anything. So, you know, and you're, it also makes for sort of, sort of set work hours. And we're not also not working in the engine room a lot of the time when the engines are running, which is really great. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really noisy. Um, absolutely. We have, yeah, we've just, uh, the company I work for just got two new ships uh, mm. about a year ago. And so, they're pretty big. I mean, they're 220 meters long and yeah, they carry a fair bit of cargo and um, got slow speed engines. Whereas I did my first bit of time on medium speeds and now we're on slow speed. So that's been really interesting. I mean, learning, yeah, wow. getting to see those two different ships. I think for yeah. people that work in companies, maybe like CSL and stuff where you can be getting time on lots of different vessels. I mean, that's yeah. really amazing and yeah. like the, you know to be able to get that whereas yeah. we are i was just lucky to be here for the transition of the two ships so i've got to see different things but yeah i mean and monica what are your contracts periods like like once you go on the ship yeah. how long are you on the ship for uh for tra for a trainee for a ca yeah. cadet engineer mm -hmm. or any any sort of cadet um yeah. it's six weeks on two weeks off right um pre-covid we could get off in port yeah. when the ship was in like on a sunday we don't sail so we're allowed to go you know and go up the road and do whatever um or if you got a bit of time during the day you could go up to you know get what you needed or whatever so we're really lucky like that since covid no one's off the ship so you're on there for six weeks yeah. um if you're qualified and you're permanent you're doing four on four off 
four. And and qualified yeah. officers are doing four on and four off. Yeah. And, and and Monica, you mentioned something about slow speed ships. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean by that for people who don't know what slow speed ships are? And... Um, slow speed, slow speed engine. So yeah. we have, I don't, like ours are a bit different. We've got very small slow speed engines, yeah. but we, and we use a controllable pitch propeller. So mm -hmm. a lot of slow speed engines use fixed pitch. So if they want to reverse, mm -hmm. they have to reverse the engine and that sort of thing. Whereas we don't have to do that, but we do have um, slow speed engines on our vessels, which is more typical in shipping, like in all the large vessels, uh, yeah. right, you know, cargo vessels around and, the world. And what are the... And what are the advantages of having those slow speed engines uh, on ships? The advantages, I guess. Is it fuel I saving? Think. Does it save fuel and uh, pollution control and all those kind of things? Is yeah, that... I mean, we have scrubbers on our vessels, which is oh, also yes, quite right. different. Um, I think we're, we're only ships in Australia that have scrubbers since these right. new emission standards come in, um, instead of using low sulfur diesel. So we're still on HFO and then we use scrubbers. Um, look, they're meant to be better how to weight ratio thing. I think because yeah. we we had four medium speed engines and I think to be able to power a larger vessel I mean I'm trading guys yeah <laughs> so I could be wrong here and everyone can no, tell me right. but um we wanted a bit larger vessel and so you yeah. need a lot bigger medium speeds and I think they just thought that for you know a large vessel most around the world are big vessels are slow speeds sure yeah. And uh, Monica, could you, before we, uh, thank you very much for giving us all that knowledge uh, and uh, <laughs> a little bit about uh, what you see yourself doing in, like, where do you see yourself going in future for all those people out there who are watching you and uh, are passionate about becoming marine engineers. What is, what are your future plans? Where do you see yourself going uh, from here after you get your certification, of course? Well, yeah, hopefully, I mean, I'll be lucky enough, hopefully, to get to work at, at the company I'm at and get yeah. enough work to be able to, you know, enough relief work to be able to eventually, you know, get a full-time position. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's the end goal, I guess, and yeah. sit my orals and I guess as my sea time, if I, as I get more sea time, you know, sit my next orals and I don't yeah, think I'm going to change careers again. I think yeah. it's, <laughs> I put enough effort into this one. I think I'm going to stick at this one for a while. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and Monica, one thing I have to address, um, and please feel free not to talk about it, but you know, traditionally seafaring and merchant navy and the kind of uh, profession we are in it is traditionally known as a very male dominated profession. Uh, yeah. to see uh, that it's still being dominated by males. And of course, if it is, then uh, what has your experience been and what advice would you give to, uh, you know, young girls out there who want to join C and uh, I just think you have to work hard. Like I felt maybe personally that I felt like I had to work harder to prove myself, mm. to prove, mm. you know, to prove myself, but I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think mm. if in, whether you're male or female, like mm. if you work hard, then mm. you get, gain respect. Mm. And I think that's the biggest thing. You have to have a thick skin, but I think again, you know, that's just sea thing. You've got to have a thick skin and whether you're male or female, you know, mm. it's, it can be hard. And mm. yeah, you just have to be able to work hard, prove yourself and yeah, be thick skinned. <laughs> yeah. And I think slowly the, this profession, the seafaring profession is trying to achieve a balance uh, between males and females. I mean, of course, when I joined 25 odd years back, that time, of course, it used to be considered a male dominated profession, but these days, even from very traditional countries or, uh, you know, conservative countries, like Asian countries, a lot of women are coming into the workforce. So it's not that uh, women are not. Yeah. And it is like any other job these days. Isn't yeah. It? Uh, yes. yeah, I just saw a girl that got um, the first girl from Bangladesh that became a marine engineer. So that's, you know, that's awesome. <laughs> like, that's yeah. fantastic. And um, even I've noticed since I've been on board, I think maybe on the ships that I work on, mm -hmm. there was one female IR prior to that and now I mean that I think we have a female deck cadet on at the moment I mean I haven't been on for a year but this would have, the guys have told me mm. and I think we've had two trainee female trainee IRs coming through even you know and that's in the five years I've been there so mm. I mean it's already becoming a lot more so that's fantastic absolutely. you know absolutely yeah and that is the message i want to send out to any of uh, maybe any parents watching or any young girls watching out there that 
this seafaring profession is no longer considered what it used to be considered before that very male dominated women are coming to the workforce and uh, mm. gender balance here. Uh, thank you, Monica, so much for your time today and for sharing your experience and uh, giving us so much, so much inspiration, especially the insp your journey has been very inspiring. Uh, and uh, before we end the video, if you guys have any questions, please write it in the comment section. I'll pass it on to Monica and she will try her best to answer. Uh, thank you, Monica. Um, no worries. Thanks. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Bye.